It's possibly the last place on Earth you would want to end up in after a plane crash. Air New Zealand Flight 901 crashed into Mount Erebus on Ross Island, Antarctica, on November 28, 1979. A McDonnell Douglas DC-10, carrying 257 passengers and crew, disappeared whilst on a sightseeing trip to the southern icy continent. The incident is a textbook case of a controlled flight into terrain. What makes this incident more chilling than others is the amount of photographs and video taken from on board the plane itself before the crash. As this was a sightseeing flight, many passengers packed cameras and even some consumer film cameras, a rarity in the 1970s. Whilst making a low pass over what the crew thought was McMurdo Sound in Antarctica, ground contacts would lose communication with the plane, to which wreckage was later found strewn over the face of Mount Erebus. The Mount Erebus disaster is not only one of the worst disasters to ever occur in aviation, but is also considered to be a monumental loss of life to the country of New Zealand. The aftermath of the crash was steeped in controversy and suspected corruption. The event, on occasion, is still talked about to this day. So what exactly happened on this flight? Why did Air New Zealand Flight 901 crash in Antarctica? The continent of Antarctica is a vast icy desert. There are fewer than 5,000 total human inhabitants on the continent during the summer months. Winters are perpetually dark and bitterly cold, while the summers are full of bright sunshine, but even then temperatures are still nearly always below freezing. It is just about the most inhospitable place on the planet. Still, the continent is beautiful. Untouched natural beauty and unique biodiversity have always captivated explorers, scientists, and even just regular everyday people. Though tourists have been known to visit Antarctica throughout the years, the continent was not always as accessible as it is today. In the late 1970s, Qantas and Air New Zealand operated sightseeing leisure flights to Antarctica. Utilizing the large planes of the time, such as the Boeing 747 and Douglas DC-10, along with the new navigation technology of the day, these flights were made possible. People would book tickets as if they were going on any other flight, and for 10 to 12 hours, passengers would spend all day traveling down to the icy continent to marvel at the frozen wilderness below. On November 28, 1979, Auckland Airport in New Zealand. This Air New Zealand DC-10 flying as Flight 901 would make one of these sightseeing flights for the last time. In the morning of that day, prior to 8am, preparations were being made for the flight's departure. Before the trip to Antarctica, the plane would make a stopover at the city of Christchurch on New Zealand's South Island. More passengers would join the flight here, however, the majority of those boarded in Auckland. Piloting the DC-10 was a crew of three, although there were a total of five members of the flight crew working in shifts. Captain Thomas James Collins, age 45, had been flying the DC-10 since 1975. With over 11,000 total flying hours, he has nearly 3,000 logged in the DC-10. There were two first officers on board. The first was 37-year-old Gregory Mark Casson. Up till this point, he had logged just under 1,400 hours in the DC-10 and nearly 8,000 flying hours in total. The second first officer was Graham Neville Lucas. He would not be on the flight deck by the time that the accident occurred. There were also two people on board acting as flight engineer, but they changed shifts during the flight. Firstly, Nicholas John Maloney had logged 1,700 hours in the DC-10. In the final moments of the flight, he would leave his seat to allow Gordon Barrett Brooks to take over as flight engineer. Brooks had logged 3,000 hours in the DC-10. On top of the five flight crew members, there were also a total of 15 flight attendants and one flight commentator, acting as a sort of tour guide. His name was Peter Mulgrew. Aged 52, he was a New Zealand mountaineer who was an expert on Antarctica, and even traversed the continent. Neither the captain nor first officer flying had flown to Antarctica before this flight. They were, however, briefed on their flight plan 19 days before the flight. In this briefing, pilots were shown a film, an audio-visual presentation which included the flight path over McMurdo Sound, where the plane would descend down to. There would be no mention of the plane flying over Mount Erebus, as understood by other Air New Zealand pilots who attended the same briefing.
Two of the pilots on board before the flight attended a flight simulation course to familiarize themselves with the navigational differences at latitudes greater than 60 degrees south. The navigational equipment of the time would often not be as reliable the further a plane gets towards the Earth's poles. At 8.17am local time in Auckland, New Zealand, Air New Zealand Flight 901 departed Auckland on the first leg of their trip to Christchurch. Once leaving New Zealand's South Island, the route to Antarctica involved a flight south of the mainland to pass over the Auckland Islands. Flying further south from here, the crew will navigate their plane to the Balani Islands, a small group of islands located off the coast of Antarctica. From here, the plane will make a left turn on course for Cape Hallett. There was in fact an old Antarctic station here, but it was evacuated in 1973. From here, passengers would be able to look out of their windows and catch a glimpse of the Antarctic continent below them, many of them taking photographs and some taking video, of which some of this was later salvaged from the wreckage. The final point of interest on this Antarctic flight before turning back for New Zealand was Ross Island, of which the highest peak is Mount Erebus, an active volcano which towers above the island at over 12,000 feet. Flight 901 was expected to fly over McMurdo Sound west of Mount Erebus at a lower altitude, before turning and heading north back for New Zealand. Located on the southern tip of Ross Island is the permanent settlement of McMurdo Station. This is about the closest human habitat on the continent that comes close to a regular town. There was no ground navigational aids on their route to Antarctica. While there were some radio navigational equipment at McMurdo Station and the surrounding area prior to 1979, some of these aids were removed by the time of the flight. So, on the DC-10, the crew of Flight 901 used a piece of equipment called an Inertial Navigation System, or INS. This equipment, although ancient when compared to modern systems, was the primary navigation for many airliners, especially in the 1970s. The INS is a computer which calculates a plane's position with the help of gyroscopes and motion sensors. The pilots punch in a series of coordinates into the computer. The navigational source is switched to the INS, and the plane would fly to these coordinates one after the other. In a time before modern navigation, it was an ideal instrument. At 12.18pm, Flight 901 receives meteorological information from McMurdo Station Air Traffic Control with regards to a low cloud base over Ross Island and the visual meteorological conditions there. The weather was overcast with a cloud base of 2,000 feet. Some snowfall was observed with a visibility of 40 miles. As per the flight crew's flight briefing 19 days prior to the accident flight, the minimum altitude prescribed by Air New Zealand for passing over and around Mount Erebus was 16,000 feet, to which Flight 901 was cleared to descend down to at 1218. With the correct weather conditions, this minimum altitude could be 6,000 feet. The flight plan that the flight crew were briefed on had their McMurdo Sound waypoint located west of Ross Island and thus well clear of Mount Erebus. The flight plan that the flight crew were given on the morning of the flight included a change in the waypoint coordinates. This change was made in the early hours of the morning prior to the flight by Air New Zealand operations. A difference of 2 degrees to the east was added at this waypoint. This new flight plan would take the DC-10 on a direct course for Mount Erebus. Accounting for the margin of error of the inertial navigation system, this difference meant that the DC-10 would take a flight path that was 20 to 30 miles east of where the crew were briefed on where they should be. Air New Zealand did not notify the correct persons who would then contact the flight crew with this change. Air New Zealand themselves had said that the minimum altitude here was 6,000 feet. According to a public inquiry after the accident, it was understood that in some cases, air traffic control at McMurdo Station would give permission for flight crews to descend beyond 6,000 feet. If this was the case, then Air New Zealand did not communicate this information clearly enough to its pilots, as it had been known that planes on these South Sea flights would actually fly much lower than this. Multiple sources citing that these lower altitudes were indeed written about in brochures and other tourist publications. Some photographs from these flights were even published by Air New Zealand themselves. Although Air New Zealand's own 1979 publication does advertise a view from 16,000 feet. McMurdo Sound is roughly around 40 miles across. 
The plan was to descend the plane through a series of turns, first to the right and again to the left. This would provide enough flying time to descend over McMurdo Sound. The flight crew had no idea that the course which was loaded into the plane's navigational computer would take them on a direct course to the towering Mount Erebus. On the flight deck at this time was Captain Collins at the flight controls, First Officer Casson operating radio communications. Flight Engineer Maloney had just left his seat to allow Flight Engineer Brooks to take over. Both flight engineers were on the flight deck. Flight Commentator Peter Mulgrew was also on the flight deck at this time. At 12.44, First Officer Casson radios to McMurdo ATC that Flight 901 was at 6,000 feet and was now descending to 2,000 feet, as per visual meteorological conditions allowed. As Flight 901 descended to below 6,000 feet, it is believed that Captain Collins, the one flying the plane, had experienced a psychological sensation called whiteout. In a case of low visibility in snowy conditions, or in this case in terrain consisting of snow-covered mountains, the white of the ground and the white of the sky can blend causing spatial disorientation to pilots. The towering 3,800 meter Mount Erebus was able to hide in plain sight to the pilots. After making a series of descending turns, the plane is put back onto the navigation which is being fed by the flight computer, a flight path which leads directly into the north face of Mount Erebus. Captain Collins thought he was 30 miles west of where he actually was, out over the water of McMurdo Sound. Two minutes later at 12.46, the flight engineer asked Antarctica expert Peter Mulgrew on where Mount Erebus was in relation to their current position, to which he replied, and quote, left about 20 to 25 miles. This whiteout effect that the crew were experiencing was so strong that even Antarctica expert Peter Mulgrew was fooled into thinking he was over McMurdo Sound. In the next two to three minutes just before the crash on the mountain, Peter Mulgrew on the flight deck would begin to have doubts on their position as do other members of the flight crew. Then, at 12.49, the DC-10's ground proximity warning system begins to sound on the flight deck alerting the crew of imminent collision with terrain. In these final moments, flight engineer Gordon Brooks calls out altitude information from his radio altimeter on the flight engineer's panel. The ground was coming up fast as Captain Collins calls for go-around thrust in order to save the plane from crashing into the side of the mountain. Moments later, Air New Zealand Flight 901 crashed into Mount Erebus at around 1,500 feet of altitude. Many minutes pass at McMurdo Station with no word from the plane. ATC messages were going unanswered. At 2 p.m., McMurdo issues a situation report back to New Zealand stating, Air New Zealand Flight 901 has failed to acknowledge radio transmissions. Flight 901 was expected to land at Christchurch Airport later that evening at just after 7 p.m. local time. In that time, Air New Zealand had been preparing for making an official statement in the case that Flight 901 does not turn up. The expected arrival time at Christchurch comes and goes. By 9pm, the DC-10 would have run out of fuel with still no sign of the plane. During all of this, the wreckage of Flight 901 was laying strewn over the snowy mountainside in Antarctica. It would not be discovered until 20 hours after the accident. The recovery operation then began. The crash was labelled as unsurvivable. It was likely that most passengers were either not seated or were not fastened in with their seatbelt given the nature of such a flight. Had anyone actually survived the initial crash on the mountain, they would have not been even close to prepared to face the brutal Antarctic conditions and likely have died soon after. While the DC-10 did come equipped with survival equipment, it was not equipped to deal with the Antarctic conditions. The aviation industry demanded answers this was the second major accident involving the DC-10 in 1979 alone, not including the string of incidents involving the plane throughout the 70s decade. The DC-10 involved in the crash of the Air New Zealand plane, however, was functioning as intended. All things considered, there was nothing wrong with this plane, as it was a case of a controlled flight into terrain. The aftermath of the crash was deeply marred in controversy. The scale of the disaster meant the topic was immediately thrusted into the public spotlight in New Zealand. It is the deadliest disaster to occur involving the country in recent history. After the first report was published, to many, it came across as if the airline had deliberately gone out of their way to pin the blame of the accident almost solely on the pilots. 
Many questioned the first report, as they determined that the changed coordinates did not play a part in the disaster. Many called for a public inquiry, which was granted by the New Zealand government after public outrage towards how the disaster was being spun. Once a public inquiry was launched in 1980, it was revealed that the airline had much more involvement than previously thought. While Air New Zealand insisted that the minimum prescribed altitude from the airline was 6,000 feet, implying that Captain Collins violated company policy, Air New Zealand pilots who had attended the same briefing as Captain Collins on the Antarctic route testified consistently that they interpreted that in visual meteorological conditions and with guidance from local ATC, they could descend to lower altitudes, sometimes to under 1,000 feet over McMurdo Sound. Air New Zealand retaliated with over a dozen accusations of pilot error. Their argument was that it was the fault of Captain Collins for not knowing where he was and for unknowingly flying into the side of a mountain. But still many believe that while pilot error may have played a part in this accident, it does not absolve the airline of their involvement, such as changing waypoint coordinates and failing to make correspondence with the flight crew of this change, and not clearly communicating with its pilots on the effects of whiteout. The New Zealand government at the time sided with the airline. The incident on occasion is still talked about to this day in New Zealand media. The wreckage of Air New Zealand Flight 901 still lays there on the north side of Mount Erebus. This photograph was taken in 2004. Because of the inaccessibility of the crash site, the wreckage could not be transported off of Mount Erebus. While human remains were removed and the flight recorders were salvaged, most of the wreckage remains there still to this day. Good evening everyone. Thank you so much for making it to the end of another video. I'm thinking about at some point on making a more detailed video on what happened in the Mount Erebus aftermath, as there are more layers to this story. Uh, let me know what you think about that, and let me know if you would like to see that video sometime. Anyway, if you enjoyed this week's video, be sure to subscribe, as there are new videos every Saturday. This video was really made possible thanks to my patrons and their continuous support for the channel, so it is that time of the week where I must take a moment to share my thanks. If you would like to get your name featured or read out at the end of the next video, you can join my Patreon from £3 per month, and also get early access to all new videos two days before they go out on YouTube. So, a thank you to my £5 patrons, Aidan Montgomery, Hector Palmatellas, Jacopo, KTP123, Ken Zachman, Christy, Marie Ennis, Pacman7, and Panic Chicken. Special thanks to my generous £10 patrons for their continued support as well Cherub Cherub, Daniel Hendricks, D. Rogers, Mike Milton, Side Effect, and Will Tanner. Thank you so much, I greatly appreciate it. And that is it from me for now. Have a great day, and I will see you next week. Goodbye!